And here we go again with another edition of the Lead Into Artcast, a show where a couple of visual storytellers get together, take a walk around a topic, try to look at it from every conceivable angle, talk about it in a little bit of an abstract way, but then try to put all this thinking into some kind of actionable thing to do. We think hard about visual storytelling, so you will too. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. The other host is... Hey, Jersey. I'm Rob Stenzinger. I'm a coder and designer of UX and games. Mm, the, 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 the description is evolving. Mm-hmm. Mm, moving. Oh, now I yep. feel like I need to get, re-examine mine. Does that still hold true? Yours is like this powerful atom that is, I mean, or a molecule that's, that, I mean, is very stable and powerful. So I'm not a chemist, but I don't know what that would be. <laughs> so what, what, is the, what is this show, Rob? What do we do with this thing? I, uh, I, said, I, I gave like a broad stroke on it, but I wonder if you could put a fine point on it. Yeah, well, so we, we dive into a topic and we take a couple of um, couple of layers of depth at, in our dive. The, the the first part is like, well, why are we exploring this? What makes us think of this? And it and it's uh, I you could I thought you you said it well. Uh, I would call it uh, it's a very conceptual area of the podcast. And then we switch into like a more detailed, um, hands-on action takeaway type stuff where. Um, we thought it was worth exploring this topic, and these are some things we've observed that are handy for us to navigate the topic, might be useful for you too. These, it could be literally tools or techniques, who knows, but it's more tangible. It's, some, it's like you can clearly do something, not just think about it, like in the earlier part. Well said. And this, this episode, I mean, you probably kind of have an idea if you downloaded it, you saw the title, something about printing, something about comics. Uh, th but, but we're going to explore this in an interesting way, I think. Uh, and this, this topic was actually inspired by one of our wonderful Patreon supporters, uh, Angela Mitchell. We do this uh, open mic on the Patreon page, patreon.com slash lean into art. And there uh, we, you know, just hash out different things, with, you know, all sorts of things that we talk about with the people who support the show. Uh, and Angela suggested, like, hey, maybe you could do something about, you know, printing, printing things. And uh, you responded, Rob, I'm sure we can find a lean into art angle on that. And uh, <laughs> that was like, it's like a trigger for me. I was like, all right, challenge accepted. Let's figure out what, what would be our approach to talking about printing. Because it's one of those things where I feel like it's easy to default to a best and worst practices because it is something where there's a desired outcome and there's a lot of ways to not arrive at that desired outcome. Does that sound fair to say? Well, yeah, and there are de desired outcomes and approaches that fit different people in, their, in different circumstances. So what, how could we frame that up and say, well, what might fit like the, the small... Um, you know, where you're just starting out versus like, let's say you are just, you know, starting to, to get um, more of a, um, a larger audience and then maybe you're working on a team. All these things could be different circumstances. Um, or even uh, if you've been around the block a couple of times and done a couple yeah. books like me, and but you've got a new thing that you're working on where you're getting ready to print that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, time to revisit all of this thinking once again, right? With each project, there's going to be new uh parameters, new variables, uh, and, and the technology changes all the time. So get this. Uh, I mean, just like as a, this is like sort of like a, not a broad framework, but it's like sort of a tease of what's coming down the line. Um, I've been doing these books for um, the city of Chelsea in these comic books for the city of Chelsea for years. When I first started five years ago, print-on-demand technology was such that doing um, – Full page bleeds was very, very cost prohibitive. Like it, it raised the unit cost a lot. So I designed the pages so as not to bleed, right? And then we switched to a new printer with one of the more recent books, and the printer says, like, how come these pages aren't bleeding? It looks like you want to do a bleed here, but you're not doing a bleed. I'm like, well, because, because. And they're like, well, it's really easy to do that now. You know, the like technology changed just in five years, you know? So, yeah, like, it, this is something that's worth going back and revisiting again and again with each new project because situations change. But before we get to that, Rob, should we do our first bit? Yeah, let's do that. All right. Okay, well, sounds good, Jersey. <laughs> this, uh, um, we have, uh, we're, we're sponsored, this podcast, in, and uh, we, we have the ability to reach out to us if you go to leanintoart.com slash advertise. Uh, you could be here too. 
This episode happens to be sponsored by Jersey and myself, where we have projects that we, you, <laughs> we recommend you go check out. If you, if you like this, you want to get some more things that, that are you know, inspired and, and actually crafted by our own creative minds, uh, please do so because it's super supportive and we love it. And thank you for doing that. A um, couple of examples I want to give you. You're like, my gosh, I'm fired up. I want to go click on something. So I, I would say uh, go to boulderandfleet.com for oh, okay. an incredible <laughs> comic. <laughs> Jersey's waiting. What's he going to say? Uh, <laughs> I had them all queued up, but I didn't know which I, one you were going to start with. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, yeah, a little squirrely, but uh, Boulder and Fleet, yeah, uh, it, it, this is a comic about a bird and a bear who are adventurers. They're out to help others, right wrongs out in the world. It's like super cute, uh, incred incredible Hulk kind of thing, like classic sh show where, you know, they go from town to town. There's trouble, they tr they, and, and they're there to help, and it's amazingly well-crafted, beautiful comic, and super fun. And Great there are say. ways... Hmm. Uh, it's not just kind. It's amazing. Check it out, boulderandfleet.com. And there's a Patreon that Jersey has that supports this comic where it's at patreon.com slash Jersey. Yes? Mm -hmm. That is and correct. I'm trying to pull up one of the recent posts that I did um, because uh, I do be, I do like in-process art and behind-the-scenes posts there. So like early page drops mm -hmm. and then also like like while I'm penciling the pages and working on future pages, I'll share some of the in-progress art like this. So, yeah, which is I mean, which is really cool too. So you, you get to like see behind the scenes. You're 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 putting money towards supporting uh, Jersey's project and him as an artist, and uh, and you get really cool uh, little little bonuses for for doing so. No, oh, here's uh, some here's some uh, in, some character designs that I have been uh, nice. working on for the future story. And actually, right. this was this was behind the Patreon wall. So this is like a you know getting a sneak peek at the kind of stuff we'll see behind the scenes. All right. Sweet. So, but you do a thing too, Rob. Let's talk about that thing you do. Yeah, well, there's uh, I have a game out, it, um, a couple games out. One one that that is uh, very recent is called This Panda Needs You, and it's a game that's that's it's all ages, but definitely targeted toward the younger folks out there who happen to have iPads, and who are interested in stacking blocks and knocking them over, and essentially you can do this to help a little panda get through a whole series of levels where the panda shows up, there's a stack of blocks, and this little cloud comes along and blows them over. And here you are, though. You can help the panda you know, set, set those blocks up again right. Uh, might go well, might be challenging, but that's up to you to, to sort of you know, work, work through it. It's easy at first, gets incrementally harder and harder, and still fun along the way. Um, that's something that can help with you know, learning pattern recognition, hand-eye coordination, stuff like that. And uh, I am working on a new version that, of course, if you do purchase the, the, uh, ver uh, the uh, iPad um, version available in the iTunes App Store, uh, you will, and if you have other iOS devices like iPhones and whatnot, it will uh, work on them as well when that gets released. Mm -hmm. So it won't be a separate app. It'll be a universal app. Oh, wow. Yep. This-panda.com. It's, yes. There you go. Find out more there. And then finally, if you uh, are looking for more of an artifact of, of the, the show itself, it's like, well, I'm really here for the show. Then mm -hmm. we have a whole bunch of things at leanintoart.com slash workshops where we have videos you can download, uh, which are essentially video versions of our workshop sessions that we've led in all sorts of different locations. Comics workshops, design workshops, um, you know, making video game workshops. And that's all available at leanintoart.com slash workshops. Pay what you want. You don't even have to pay nothing if you don't want to. I know, <laughs> and I've and some I've we we've seen that we get notifications. So hey, it's cool. We see people are interested. I also see people come back and then pay. I've it, yep. it's a pretty great, pretty great thing. Um, and yep, there you go. That's uh, that's what you can do to support this show. And we thank everybody who does. So with that, mm -hmm. let's go ten thousand feet up, shall we? Yeah. Look at the topic in abstract. Look for all the hidden dimensions and depths. Look for the hidden gems that come out of thinking really hard about things, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you can get, get more of a foothold on like, why you're doing something. Why? What a good question. It's, it is something. Um, <laughs> seriously, I know. I'm like, <laughs> yes, quite. That, this, is also, this is the yes, quite part of the show, actually. Uh, uh, Commander McBrag? Uh. <laughs> yeah. It's... Uh, well, so on the, and this, yeah. So when you ask why, when you're you're when you're on your creative safari, um, mm. 
Commander McBrag style. Um, like I was doing this with, with other goal planning recently. And there's this whole design exercise called the five whys. And it really doesn't matter how many number of, number of whys you ask. But um, like I had a couple of goals that like I really believed in, but I couldn't describe well. And so I would take it and I'd say, well, why do I want that? And then, well, because it would lead to this. Well, why do I want that? Then, okay. And, and then it, w- it led to uh, me having hit it from a few angles and digging into it. And um, just through the, that classic, you know, question that, that people can, I don't know, characterize as being, you know, silly or childish, uh, you know, when people keep asking why, it, I, I think it can be actually super constructive. For instance, um, okay, why do you even want to put your work into print? Because you just do it, that's all. <laughs> because is a start, Okay. <laughs> Um, then <laughs> you're, you're doing it. So there, that, <laughs> obviously I'm being a little silly here, but modeling the whole why exercise. Well, well, okay. So why would you do that? I mean, is there something you saw or someone who told you this? Well, yeah, I see things in print in stores and mm-hmm. physical artifacts mean something was done. It is a representation of effort. It is a atomic uh provable empirical item that's that 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 is my evidence and and proof that i uh i'm an author mm-hmm. i belong on the stage right um mm. well yeah okay so um and some of what we're referring like some some of our processes don't produce anything physical until maybe this this step which right. is interesting so I mean, you see a lot of people, yeah. I see a lot of, at least in my f- social feeds, I see a lot of cartoonists who, when they finish a graphic novel, they take a picture of all the completed pages. Have you seen these? Mm, like all the, oh, like a stack? Yeah. I've seen, a, be, yeah, like, yep, I've seen that kind of stack. Like, here's, here's a year of my life, they say, and like, it'll be a yeah. pile of bristle, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we, there's something about us that needs that, right? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, it's super tangible. It, yeah. It's... It is, I haven't looked up tangible in a while, but I'm pretty sure it's darn close to you can touch it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And that there is a factor to that, that that is, I think, significant, where you make things that are intangible, uh, they can deliver delight, you can have experiences with it, and you carry those with you, they can't be destroyed, that's beautiful. But I want a stack of books, I want to stub my toe on a book, I want to see a book on a shelf, I want to, you know, affect the physical world and i is it's there... totemic magic right i've used that term yeah. before on the show but it's like it's <laughs> like it's this item that's imbued with something right whereas like 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 the force comes from within and it's all around us it's everywhere and it's like you know you can't see it but you can feel it you know but like <laughs> totemic magic like if i got a book and it's got spells in it watch <laughs> out <laughs> i'm gonna drop this thing you know <laughs> it's a different thing Okay, so then okay, you mentioned spells and like, okay, I'm going to print comics and I'm going to cast, here's awesome comic at you, yep. uh, audience. Right? Magic missile. <laughs> Magic comic missile. Uh, let me roll my four, uh, four-sided die. Where'd it go? Um, <laughs> and uh, I always thought Wizards had the hard, hard, hard roll of it, like too hard of a go of it, but I don't know. Um, anyway, the, uh, the, that selling, okay, well, that lets you make more of those things. I mean, you, keep, you, you have to keep it going somehow. You need to eat. You need to um, engaging in the audience is one thing. Having the, them respond, that's, that's one thing. But then the actual good can be traded. Yes. And I would also say that not everybody uh, likes to read things on screens, right? And, and I don't mean that in any kind of pejorative or weird way. You know, it's mm-hmm. like that's just the taste thing. There are people who prefer to read atomic or paper items, mm-hmm. right, rather than electron items. Um, oh, shoot. I did not look at that up for the show notes. But there there has been a dip, I believe, in Kindle uh, book sales to really? sort of back that up. Yeah, shoot. Um, there's uh, – uh, I, I want to look it up because I saw so Kindle – uh, book sales dip, and uh, I, 
ebook sales fall after new Amazon contract. So I don't know cause and effect here. Yeah, this was in September of uh, of 2015. So I don't know if it was sort of like well, whatever. If was it a business arrangement changing the supply that changed what could be purchased, or was it purchasing behavior? I don't know, but I know like that was an event, and to me, it just uh, it shows that well, there's at the very least different behaviors, different pockets of interests. Mm. And at the very least, we can whether or not one is more popular than the other, we can at least acknowledge that there is still a and there and I I would predict there is going to continue to be a segment of the population who finds a printed format to be a more convenient way to read. Does that seem like does that is that a safe statement? So that the uh, that there's a. Each audience has their most convenient option, right? And, and, but a, I, yeah. and I'm, I'm I'm arguing that, or I'm stating that I I predict that there will always be some piece of the population who finds print to be the most convenient way to read information. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, that's another. That's okay. So you, one thing that reminds me of are well, um, people with uh, let's see people with different abilities, people with disabilities and being accessible. So accessibility with, mm -hmm. with your work, that's something that, that we don't often have to think of with, with comics, but there's a, there's a factor there as well where um, some, some people get headaches looking at screens. Um, some people don't want to carry books because they're too heavy and, and they hurt their back, you know, and like, anyway, different needs, different pockets. Um, how much, uh, how populated are each of those pockets for your work? That's another question. Um, that's, uh, you know, hopefully getting some kind of temperature read from your audience on that. Um, so I think we, I, I, does, that, does that seem like a fairly good survey or at least a cursory survey of like reasons why we might want something in print? Yeah, definitely. So then let's talk about what, what impediments we find. Generally speaking, what are some okay. challenges one faces when, okay, yeah, I've decided that here, I've, I've identified the why, whatever, which one it was. But what are some of the things that we have run into or things that we can predict running into in terms of uh, friction or static or challenges in, in getting things printed? Um, well, I mean, you have the wide, the, the general buckets. If you look at the whole, this whole thing as, as a... Um, uh, a creative process where you you have the um, the creation of your work that you know getting it finished and ready for print in some form, but it was print your initial plan, right? Because so almost you have this sort of a platform question to begin with, where if it, if it, if your thing was primarily intangible, primarily digital, all of a sudden you 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 are now transitioning this this creative product to another platform that has different constraints um, right. and different different uh, uh, benefits too because you know things like what like like uh, um, like page bleeds have a different impression um, the spread double page spreads right 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 the spread becomes a completely mm -hmm. well depending on the way you present the work online I know some people who present their work in spreads but yes but for the most part most of us don't um, and then depending on what platform you're on, if you're on something like a Tapastic or a, uh, a, a, I forget the line, I think it's just called line comic, hmm. uh, the line comic app where like the, the vertical scrolling is highly recommended. So like you're designing pages that go in an infinite scroll rather than have like a page, uh, paradigm, right? So depending on how you started all that, printing's going to present a whole new range of, um, uh, limitations and constraints and mm -hmm. benefits, um, like even color, right? Like, oh right, gosh, yes. Greens absolutely. are RGB, red, green, blue. Paper is CMYK, cyan, magenta, black, and yellow, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it depends. I think that so, like, if I'm remembering correctly, that's true. But then, depending on where which printer. They may want you to be in RGB color space. Mm -hmm. Like I think Kablam wanted that. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I don't know. Like I'm, I need to look again. I'm, just, I'm, with, I'm yeah. getting some books printed from them pretty soon, so um, 
I need to look at their specifications again because I know they've changed over the years. A um, long time ago, I think it was like you submitted everything as TIFF files, but I think now it's PDFs. Um, wow. Yeah, so like their technology is changing all the time. Yep. Um, Which all of that is sort of uh, learning the l learning the ropes of the of the platform you've chosen, right? Yeah. And uh, or evaluating multiple options. So there's there's a, there's a lot of work to do there. Essentially, the production work is uh, is 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 a job. It's not it's not an afterthought or no thought. Right. At the very least. Right. Um, I don't know if anybody who's listening has gone through Amazon Create Space, but I uh, attempted to do that with um, the front. I know Dawn Griffin Griffin has. She was she was a okay. guest on the on the on the Lean and Torrent cast. Um, okay, yeah, that was one of the ones where I, I had to miss it, right? Yeah. Yes. And Create Space, I just found it to be very challenging to make my pages match what they wanted. Um, hmm. And I didn't have, it was one of those things where it's like I, I walked into it thinking like, oh, this is going to take like a couple hours this afternoon and I'll be done. You know, I've, mm -hmm. I've made a PDF before, just going to the Adobe Bridge, export, I'm done, right? Oh, okay, well, that won't work. Well, I can set up an InDesign template and I guess I can manually feed in all these pages. Fine, I'll export it. Oh, that didn't work either? Oh, crap. You know, yeah. so, you know, reading reading their file formats, playing with their templates. Uh, and then and then there's a whole other thing about, like, your design uh, software knowledge versus what they've expected you to know. So, like, one of the things that I run into is a guy who's worked in uh, graphic design for a long time, like, since the mid-'90s. Um, I'm used to using things like the Adobe Suite, like Adobe InDesign, Quark Express, uh, and then I go to some of these print uh, companies, and they're like, here's a Microsoft Word template. Just put your images in there. I'm like, yeah, how do I do that? I don't even know how to manage images in a Microsoft Word template. And maybe <laughs> if, I ha if I'd never used any of the Adobe Suite, and that, that all I worked in is in the Office Suite, sure. But, right, so, like, wow. they, their expectations versus my expectations, that can sometimes mismatch, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, there's... Uh... Then there are, are sort of um, little artifacts or, or, or things to consider because you're going into print that you're, they're going to affect your production process. Like you have to account for like a, maybe a barcode or ISBN. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Then uh, let's see. Uh, well, most web comics that I've encountered don't need a spine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, they may have like cover front, front and back pages depending, but like, uh, yeah, those print books. If if it's not essentially like a floppy, it's there's a spine, right? And so you have to design yeah. that spine. You have to understand how thick the spine is going to be based on what kind of paper that's being used, and then and then we're bringing up a whole another realm of concern, which is the cover design, which is something mm -hmm. I've talked about in years past in in shows. Is like the very first edition of the front that I produced in like 2007 had a different kind of cover. I had a lot of trouble moving the books off the table. I changed the cover to something more simple and cleaner and more, you know, uh, recognizable from a distance. And the book sell, uh, sold better at shows, right? Um, That's so interesting. So now you, yeah, another piece of like that physical artifact. Yay, you have something in the physical world, but it has different jobs to do compared to, you know, it, it's, it's, it's digital version. Um, yeah. typically people aren't looking at digital things from super far away. That's why, at least for comics, they are, they're not being read across the room from what I understand is, um, I, I'm you know, pretty there's, sure there's on the Thunder Punch Daily show, there's one of those He-Man morals. I always tack on the end of mm -hmm. the uh, episode and there's one with Zodak where he says, there are times where everyone dreams of being very rich or powerful, but what they don't think about are the problems and responsibilities that go with it. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, you know, it's really easy to gain entry into this comics business. You know, make a comic. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of problems or responsibilities that come with the gig where you have to think about a lot of different you know, layers of this stuff. Um, and and we're, all, we're also dancing around a big topic, money, right? Mm. Um, it is trivial to get your stuff on the web now and often for free, right? Tapastic, put your stuff on Tapastic. Tumblr, put it on Tumblr. A uh, bunch of other, Comic Chameleon and a whole bunch of other different kinds of hosting uh, sites. Um, it, it's not free to print. Um, even if you do use something like a Kablam slash Indie Planner print on demand kind of thing where they like will print it and fulfill it for you, there's the cost of if you want any copies for yourself, and there's the cost of time in learning how to set up your files properly and designing your your uh, book so that it is uh, uh, an attractive product. Mm -hmm. So.
Either way, you're looking at costs, right? Definitely. And there's ways to mitigate that. So if you take an overall approach that is uh, experimental, like doing small experiments all along the way, like, I don't know, I haven't designed a spine. How's that going to look? Well, depending on the, the vendor you're, you're dealing with, they may have like a little process to test it that's automated, or they may have someone look at it and say, Mm-mm, nope, here's some feedback. Um, and, you know, especially if you're, you're really easy to work with and, and uh, you know, thoughtful in your communications um, versus a uh, uh, being a tough customer could lead to um, just, you know, losing out on some of that feedback and goodwill. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then on top of all of this, I'm going to layer on one more layer of all of this, uh, of this uh, anxiety sandwich or <laughs> anxiety <laughs> layer cake. Um, distribution. How are you getting it out there? Oh, well, you just go on Twitter and just tell people about it, right? We know that it's not that simple. Um, no matter how simple it may seem, it's not that simple. And then it, depending on what kind of material you've got, finding the, the right audience and where they are for, to get your print thing is super challenging. So are you going to approach wider distribution channels like Diamond Distribution, like Baker & Taylor, or are you going to have it carried on Amazon or Indie Planet or all of them, right? Um, are you going to pick one and then really invest, or are you going to spread your stuff across all so that everybody has a lot of choices? And in the uh, on-the-ground section, we'll examine like some ways to, to uh, determine those, make those choices, right? Mm -hmm. So then... Uh there's one other thing too, is uh, mm -hmm. the sort of the, the acquisition of customers, right? So uh -huh. the marketing that uh, you're, you're really hitting on it where you may get sort of some incidental marketing benefit by being part of a marketplace where you have your, your book is now on technically on Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. Biggest store in the world. My, my book's there. Uh, I'm, I'm already um, planning to, you know, the, for the interior of my limo, right? Um, <laughs> probably, yeah, that uh, you, you should hold off on that because you will have to drive traffic to that. It's and, and, and somehow through the connections you've, you've made socially and whatnot, promote your stuff on your own, promote your stuff through some kind of ad campaign, promote your stuff through, you know, find a way, right? Being scrappy, joining other collaborators. Um, yeah. Advertising on your podcast. Hey, yeah, there is that. I mean, because like your app is on the biggest app store in the world, right? Oh, yeah. Pretty so, sure lots so of folks are out there. The <laughs> moment you hit submit, then like dollars just started coming out of the uh, the floppy disk drive on the computer, right? <laughs> that's, I was like, why is it doing that? <laughs> well, that's where my money went. Um, no, it's, <laughs> it's uh, the... Okay, here's a, here's a quirky thing. Sometimes... Not ex not to that extreme, but sometimes you get a little bit of more attention because you're early in the life of that marketplace, and it's like there's not many people, not many products there, but yet there's enough attention, mm -hmm. and it's growing fast enough where it keeps that attention. Yeah, um, yeah Guitar Fredder benefited from that. So, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. Being being a, out out at the time when there was a lot less lot less competition, so. That's something to consider as okay. far as choosing a marketplace where, yeah, some vendors come with a marketplace and, yeah. I so know. we've established Marketing. why you might want to do it or rather confirming why you might want to do it. And then like sort of like we took a flashlight and just scanned across a bunch of suspects in terms of challenges, right? Uh, but how do you navigate those choices? Uh, we will, in, in, in a minute and 30 seconds... We will uh, go over, Rob and I put together a rubric to help us, and we're going to test this rubric on the show to help us navigate some of these different choices when determining uh, how to get a book, what kind of technology you want to use to get your book printed and what kind of distribution channels you might want to use, uh, and potentially, potentially even like how you determine color versus black and white, page count. We will test it. We will see if it works. This is the lab that we're about to enter. But before we go there... It is time for us. Oh, and let me pull up the Patreon. I, I started the music before I opened up the Patreon page, Rob. <laughs> uh, well, well tell, me, tell us about the Patreon see, page, Rob. Our Patreon page is at patreon.com slash lean into art. And if you go there and you support us, become a patron, um, you may be on this list at some point because we thank all of our patrons and uh, patron, patrons at Patreon, but uh, we have this list of top five supporters 
And uh, we really appreciate, for instance, Cameron Callahan, who on Twitter is at Cam Callahan. And uh, there's a comment here that Jersey saw your post on the Art and Story podcast, which uh, we can, we have a URL for that. We'll link to it in the show notes, but it's at CameronCallahan.net or stream dot Cal- Cameron Callahan dot net. He made a mm-hmm. very nice comment about something I said to him years ago about web comics. Super cool. And then there is Owen Jollins, who is comic colorist. He's been a guest on the show. Lots of cool resources. He's done some great podcasting during the uh, Art Sound Off season as well. And also thank you, Colleed Birdsong, who is at Colleed Birdsong on Twitter and at fried chicken and sushi dot com. Also thank you, Rachel Ross who is at Nick Tiras on Twitter and uh, available at Glimmerville.com. And of course, thank you, Ashley Knapp, who is Control-Alt-Lee, as in like the keys on the keyboard, control Control alt lee on Twitter. And thank you, Ashley. Yeah, we haven't mentioned Ashley in a while. And, she uh, was a guest on the show too a while back. Yeah, she has. Yeah. Uh, About it, journaling. That's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ashley is so great, and uh, yeah, all of you guys who support us on uh, on Patreon, thank you so much. Your support means a lot to us. It helps us make this thing sustainable. So, mm-hmm. uh, is it time for more music? I think it's time for more music. I'll play the heavy music. It's time <laughs> it's to get down to time. business. Mm-hmm. To go on the ground, boots on the ground, as they say, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. No. Now it gets real. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so let's talk about this rubric that we put together uh, a few days back. Yeah. Um, one way to frame up providing service to an audience is thinking about the essentially the problems or, you know, goals that you have. Like what, what does it solve for you and why, why you think you're doing it? You might want to do the five whys exercise to dig in deeper if you're like, well, that sounds not quite clear enough. So, so okay, you let's say you clarify the problems it's solving for you and uh, then what's it solving for your audience and you essentially have these two lists that uh, can be at the center of this pros and cons of of um, well the other side of okay it solves a it's a pro it's solving a problem it's helping accomplish a goal it is either uh, you know solving a friction or dealing with the pain point or it's ha- doing a particular delight right any of those is, are like okay you're serving serving in some way right but then there's likely a trade off and that would be the on the con side of things it's uh it's it may be creating a friction or um, some kind of difficulty for providing that service or for the reason you would go about it like is it still worth doing and which which of these trade-offs do you navigate to try to make it worth doing but is it that simple is it is it a binary choice rob well it's super complicated <laughs> um because it's it's not quite just binary pros and cons it's the the, the that dimension of for you and your audience it's sort of by f- Exploring this, you have end up creating sort of a, a a set of concepts that, if you step back, you see the hopefully the the common um, a common ground or common theme or a way through, right? That um, that's like this this sort of uh, a plan, right? How do you move forward? Yeah, but uh, I. This was this was your doing when you said like you you sort of added that extra access to it by saying like well there's the the, the problems that it solves for you and the problems that it solves for your your audience yeah and that really helped me frame up the choice for myself right because um, mm. I think about I think about like when when I am teaching a class and there's like this this like very clear service that I'm trying to provide for the students, right? But there's also another dynamic there in that I also don't want it to be boring for me, right? I don't if, if even if I find a very effective lesson plan, um, I don't want to just do it over and over and over and over again until it becomes a dry thing for me because by by not by ignoring me as a fa- my pleasure as a factor in this thing, I inevitably will ignore the student's service in the thing. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. 
These things are interdependent, is what I what I'm trying to say. That's that's an awesome way to 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 um, just nail that point. There is an interdependency that you're trying to uh, elaborate, discover by by exploring this map. Mm-hmm. And, Absolutely. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a common ground. It's a it's a reason for all of you to to have this connection in the product that you're making. Do we want to test out one of the different choices through this rubric and see if it works? Yeah, let's give it a shot. All right, so let's just pick one out of a hat. We'll take print on demand, right? Here, it's an easy one. It's it's, it's a sort of a low-hanging fruit, and it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a technology that everybody's aware of, and it seems very accessible to everybody, no matter where you are in your experience level, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's not as abstract to a beginner as, say, offset printing. Right, like, do you even know what offset means in offset printing, right, or or web presses, right? But but most people know essentially what print on demand is. So well, yeah, I mean, so print on demand in a way, it's it's the industrial version of the printer on your desk, right? Comparatively, where yeah, the offset printing, I I don't quite get it, but I know it it does it all separately or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I couldn't tell you if I've honestly met an actual offset printer machine anywhere. <laughs> But, uh, but it. But I know, like thinking about it, it's, it is a very different different process. So print on demand, typically, it it's it feels like the list of steps and the things that you have to keep in mind to produce. Like I did a print my the book I did, um, Art Geek Zoo Hidden Talent was print on demand, mm. and uh, that felt like a the, a, it just felt more approachable. As far as a production process. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's go through some uh, pros, solving problems for you. Mm-hmm. So uh, might... okay, go. easy to learn, right? Um, that uh, the the process you would make to create a digitally distributed distributable version of your comic isn't that different from the print on demand, right? Is that fair to say. I think so, and there's a lot of like m- most of these uh, companies even have downloadable templates in which you can place the work, right? Um, I know I know Kablam has this. I know that uh, CreateSpace had it, even though I was talking about how it was kind of tricky for me to understand what they really wanted with it. Um, it's easier to learn how to do that than to say prepare uh, an eight up. Right, uh, like uh, like they, they in, in web printing they have like uh, in, in page increments of eight, and they have like a completely different kind of pagination style as a result of that. I, it may have changed since the last time I used an offset printer, but for the most part, I know it's distinctly different than using print on demand. It's a little bit more uh, challenging. Um, <laughs> now you're bringing back the memories of why I ran from it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about inventory? No inventory if you don't want it. Mm-hmm. Right, so the cool thing about print on demand, especially uh, services like Kablam or CreateSpace, is that they print it on demand. They make it as it's ordered on the site, so you don't have to have boxes and boxes of books in your house or garage. Um, there's a storage benefit to doing it, and then uh, low startup cost. Mm-hmm. Because after all, um, you're not paying for. Three thousand books, right? Like, that's another thing we should say. Right, because like, there you go. That I forgot yeah. that there's the huge the, sort of the the bulk requirement to essentially there's a, a <clears throat> the offset printing is a more efficient process as far as cost per unit. Yet, in order to that, like there's there's sort of that that I don't know the the minimum print job factor in order to reach that cost, um, that efficient cost, right? Yep. So then you end up you're like wow my pff, I print on print on demand I'm gonna have to pay like you know twelve bucks an issue or or nine bucks an issue or something like that depending if it's a floppy it's gonna be less than that right mm-hmm. and, and you know like wow geez that's really eating into my margin like I'm, what's what's left over for me what have you um, oh wow look at this this uh, anyway I know I'm going in the into, am I going too far into the cons you you might be ahead into cons sorry yeah Let, let's let's Ooh. let's do pros audience next hear me back all right. <laughs> Whoa, Rob, whoa. whoa, whoa, whoa. Rob's cool. like 30, 30 in Brave Star. Um, okay, so what, what's a pros for the audience in using print on demand? Are there any? Um, well, I like your, your point here that it's, a, it's an artifact of meeting with the author or artist. It can so be. it is a, um, it's a, 
it's a tangible piece that comes away from that because a lot of times it comes with essentially a um, a sketch. So signing the book at the least and maybe depending on uh, how you approach that as a product, that could be an upcharge, right? At mm -hmm. least the, um, uh, the, the, the sketch. Or Artist editions, right? Mm -hmm. I did this with my mini comics. I did a sale back in September or something like that. I forget what it was. But it's like you could just buy the book, and I would just mail it to you. And then if you got an artist edition for two bucks more, I did a little sketch that I included in the book, right? There you go. It's more of a. It it, it creates more of a of a a unique artifact. It's not just a thing like, hey, I bought this from the author. That's mm -hmm. cool. That that could be a a, a nice um, thing to to remember. But like, it's it's actually while well, it's made out to me, it's got a sketch in there. That's even more special. So. Yeah, I think that that is a, one of the biggest things because signing a digital comic, not as easy. So true, um, pretty huge but but also th this this pro really depends on you having print copies of your own that you take to a place or that you buy and mm. then mail out yourself because if you just do your fulfillment through Create Space, can't really sign them, right? Quite true. Um, yeah, that's you're doing your own fulfillment. Yep. If you're if you're choosing to try to um, make that part of your product, that's a good right. point. Uh, the only other one I can think of is that it's convenient reading format, right? Yeah, some people that's that is their uh, format of choice, so it lets you reach them. Um, and I mean, like artifact of meeting with the author artist could also be artifact of the thing that I enjoy. I love this comic, I, and we want what we are consumers, and what we love, we want to consume. Right. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. I mean it like we want to surround ourselves with the things that we love. And so it could be as simple as that. It's just like an artifact in general of this thing that I celebrate and enjoy. Right. Exactly. That's um, it's certainly you're certainly not talking about uh, do, making a, an Ikea catalog or whatever Fight Club was making fun of. So. <laughs> What? Thank you for laughing at that. I don't know. It's been a long time since I've seen the movie. All right. Print on demand yeah. cons mm -hmm. for you. All right. Creating friction for you. So what do we got? Um, what can we think of when it comes to um, print, cons of using print on demand services? Um, one is, generally speaking, you've got a higher unit cost. Mm-hmm. Um, now, what that means is, like, if you go through uh, an offset printer, you're gonna have to have, you have a minimum order of like say two thousand, five thousand, which means that you like, let's say it's a it's a buck fifty a unit. Let's say it's a buck a unit. Let's say it's something like really ridiculously cheap, buck a unit. You're, but you're still spending two thousand dollars on your initial print run. Whereas with print on demand, you can order as little as two, but they're gonna be three bucks a piece for your unit cost. So mm -hmm. in the long run, you're gonna be paying more per unit. Right, um, but that's a cost that you might mitigate with, with uh, you know more creative solutions to how you build an audience. This might be a, a, you were talking about Rob, like a customer acquisition period, where it's like, okay, well I can I can eat a little bit of that cost right now because I certainly can't justify spending two thousand dollars on an audience that doesn't exist yet. Right. Exactly. So one way to I I love this that that this option exists because you can test products with um, and see well does my audience um, actually buy this from me? And, and I can, you, or you can experiment on it and iterate until they do. Mm. Yeah. So like you mentioned the whole different cover versions in, uh, for the front, yeah. Yeah. that's, that's, uh, that is iterating on your product. And all of a sudden now it becomes more sellable. Now it maybe it becomes more worth um, either, having um ordering a larger batch of print on demand or you may be getting to that threshold of like well it's not that low a risk be to to do the 2000 print run because i i can move those units i'm going you know i i've gathered enough data i noticed that i sell this many per whatever um yeah I, I know we, we can't be the first to have thought of this where no. like i could easily see doing something with like with my boulder and fleet book when i finish it where i actually do five different covers for the book and take the, the comics to shows mm -hmm. and for like just do some testing where it's like okay for an hour i'm putting th only these covers out 
And then for another hour, I'm putting only these covers out, and I watch the sales. Or I put all, like, a mix and match of the covers and see which ones get picked up, right? Mm -hmm. um, and take that data back to say, okay, well, this cover clearly outperformed all the other covers. Now I know I can invest in a big print run on this book with this cover, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, there's a way, in a way, you're, you're, you're doing some form of A-B testing where mm -hmm. you essentially have a... Um, uh, like a like a control and then an experiment where the magic the best way to do that is if you could have traffic coming to your table from two different directions <laughs> <laughs> that that'd be the perfect time to to test those different covers all right so in other uh, words you're telling me that's what i got to do with kids read comics or uh, the a2 calf this is coming here oh funny hey event organizers you could find a way to um help artists you yeah. could help artists do A-B testing if you let traffic flow to their tables from two different directions. I don't know where they'd sit. They would have to <laughs> hover, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Catwalk? I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. All yeah. Right. Two you tables set, are different sides. Uh, you set my wheels turning. Okay, but let's, right. let's stay with cons. We were getting into the positive. Let's go back to the negative. Um, right. Another con is that you, they're really, you're kind of limited in your options, right? Hmm. Um it's getting better all the time, but for the most part, you can't do die cut covers. You can't do you know holograms in your covers. And I'm, I'm not using like you know really like loud examples, but you can't. It's very difficult to do like say. You remember that old book, the lady who swallowed the fly, fly children's book, where like the hole was cut in the middle of the page to like reveal what was in her stomach. Oh. I never read that version, but that's uh, the, the, that, those kind of books that have the you know reveal pages and stuff are are awesome. Yeah, we've got right. a bunch of those kinds of books, but not that you one. You know what I'm talking about, Sounds though, right? Really cool, though. Yeah. yeah, like so, like page one has a hole cut in it, revealing something that's on page two. And when you open it to page two, there's like a larger image with the context that changes what you actually saw through that hole in page one. So that kind of storytelling is kind of unavailable to you in print on demand. Uh, I remember years ago. Uh, Sarah Turner did this great mini comic about ghosts where this guy right. is moving through a house and there were these tissue paper pages that overlaid. And when you overlay the tissue page, you saw the ghost. But when you remove the tissue page, you saw only what that guy saw. And you saw, so you saw the lamp moving or like this little bit, bit of like mist moving through the room, right? So mm -hmm. she kind of gave you two ways of looking at the same scene. You can't do things like that with print on demand. It's exceedingly difficult because print on demand is really kind of just meant to be like you said, an industrial kind of version of your desktop printer. So, you know, a con is that you, uh, you don't have as many fancy printing options. However, that can be a strength in other ways, right? If you want to, again, use it for testing, or if you have very simple needs uh, for your book, like all I want is a glossy cover, boom, you're done. So that, that's not that bad of a con. Mm -hmm. uh, can we talk about distribution? Yeah. So... Um, let's see. Distribution does. Oh yeah, that's true. I guess it does become more complicated, doesn't it? Um, so like if you want to get, if you want to get distributed through something like a diamond or a Baker and Taylor, yep. they, they get a discounted cost in your cover. So now you've got higher unit costs. Let's say it costs six bucks per unit to do your 150 page graphic novel that you want to charge $12 or less for because $15 is kind of the edge of a 150 page black and white book, like in terms of like price, like generally speaking. There's another thing, another kind of research you have to do. So let's say um, I want it to be $12 or less. Okay, my unit cost is $6. Well, that means I got 100% markup. I'm making six bucks a sale. That's pretty good. Okay, but now I want to go through, I want to hit some big numbers. I want to go through Diamond. I want to go through Baker and Taylor. Well, they want, you know, they want uh, to pay, what is it? They want a 60% discount, I think. They want, they want to pay 40% of your cover price or something like that. I've 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 seen the number. It totally escapes me, but the, it's it's significant because it's a significant discount. So now they're a distributor because you think about who you're inviting to the party to share in your margin, yeah. right? Yeah. Because because okay, on one hand you are buying a book from a um, manufacturer, right, or the printer, then you are bringing that somewhere. So you are the essentially the fulfillment and distribution, or you are signing it and mailing it out of your home office or whatever, right? You're doing the distribution. It's pretty direct, you and the um, and your audience. But then you've added a bunch of layers as soon as you go into this other. You know, it's better, you've you've got the trade-off of uh, you're reaching a larger audience, likely, 
uh, almost guaranteed actually because they they are big distribution but the 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 negative is now more people need a slice to make it worth it for them and often it can mean a net loss per sale for you like mm-hmm. years ago and this is again a long time ago um, and this is the kind of thing this is the kind of research I'd be doing now as I get ready to print the Boulder and Fleet book but um, I was printing the front through Kablam, and I was trying to get it sold on Amazon. And the cost of printing the book, having it mailed to me, then mailing copies to Amazon meant that I lost money on every sale. I know with Create Space, it's a totally different bag. I can totally get the, the books printed through there, bypassing that whole situation. And that's something I need to look into. But I'm just pointing out how if you take replace Amazon with Diamond, re- replace Amazon with Baker and Taylor or Ingram, and you can see how this would become very complicated. You're paying shipping twice and you're selling the books at a steep discount. And that's why having that, that's why if you're going through distribution channels you pr- or big distribution channels, you probably want to go offset because they need those unit discounts. Right. So, uh, okay. Is that all the cons that we can think of for you in print on demand? I believe so. Yep. All right. Let me grab another color of ink here and we will turn to another page and, um, uh, as I whiteboard this for those who are just listening in the audio. Uh, so print on demand, cons, or audience. So what cons are there for your audience? What frictions does this create for your audience in using print on demand? This, this is funny. Even, um, <laughs> I've, um, I, even I have run into as far as uh, the, this, this issue of, Institutions can have a hard time with uh, with purchasing that um, uh, from a print on demand arrangement because it's not really a business to business looking transaction more or less. It looks like uh, someone is going to a website and buying a product like you would at home, and that that looks more like someone's do you know getting a sandwich while they're traveling and they they need to expense it compared to like <laughs> you know yeah it's not the same as as uh, um. Oh, we have, you know, these distributors who, you know, help us with our books um, in our bookshop or what have you, mm-hmm. and or if li- or a library, and uh, that's. Uh, I mean, some some institutions are are more flexible with that, for sure, but uh, that's some are, yeah, that but varies. institutions like libraries and schools and et cetera usually have accounts with companies like Baker and Taylor or Diamond or Ingram, which means that they have a shopping cart that they can just, this is the equivalent of instead of just going to Amazon and buying, okay, I need socks. I need a fluorescent bulb for my lamp. I need uh, some new replacement nibs for my pen and I need some batteries for my, you know, my electronic devices. Boom, 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 put them in the shopping cart and go. I don't have to think about it anymore. Right. This would be Mm -hmm. saying like, well, if you want batteries, you got to go to this site. And if you want pen tips, you got to go to that site. And if you want socks, you got to go to that site, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because in institutions, they, a lot of their how they buy things has been um, put through sort of a, a stringent analysis and legal process that they're only really supposed to buy from who they have those kinds of arrangements with. Yes, where they have accounts with, and also it's a convenience thing. It's that they don't have the time to buy individually from every single author in the entire world, right? Uh, right. There is flexibility there, as I've found in the past, but it becomes kind of tricky. Uh, there was one instance last year with some uh, educational event that I went to where the school wanted to buy my books. And it was so difficult for them to get my uh, print-on-demand books from all the different sources. I was like, well, you can get them here, here, and here. And they're like, our accounting department is just having such a hard time with this, like, would it would just be easier for us if you just brought them yourself, right? So like I wound up having to get them myself and bring them, right, rather than have them just order them. Whereas, you know, the Warren Commission report, I can just point booksellers at it, boom, go get it, and they can just get it, right? Mm-hmm. Much so, easier. So yes, this is this is a, a a friction that your audience will run into if you go with print on demand. Okay. Uh, it's different with individual sales, right? I can go buy Rob's book, no problem. But uh, that's as an individual. I don't re- represent like a whole uh, body like an institution. Anyway. Um, oh, browsing. Let's talk about browsing. Mm. 
So let's see. So browsing, um, th typically, this is kind of the marketplace thing a little bit, right? Yeah. Where um, let's say you go to, yeah, Kablam has a marketplace where. Mm -hmm. IndiePlanet.com. Yeah, IndiePlanet. There you go. Um, of course, Amazon is a giant marketplace. Yeah. And the, the discovery is, um, let's see. So the, what's, your, what's your angle on this? Let me well, hear your trade-offs. Okay. Do you go to bookstores, Rob? Hmm. Not like I used to. Okay. Once in a while. Once in a while. And it's always the, well, I remember when I used to go to bookstores all the time. <laughs> So maybe maybe I have a uh, big club over my shoulder and I drive a car with my feet and the wheels are made of stone. But every once in a while I go to a, a bookstore. <clears throat> and <laughs> while I'm there, I will go to the comic section. And I do this when I go to the comic store too. And I will actually just look at what's on the shelves. Look at what's mm -hmm. facing out. Look at what's going to catch, catch my eye. Wow, I've never seen that book before. That's an interesting cover. Uh, oh, I see that name of that author I really like. I didn't know they were working on this book. Right, um, there's a discovery that happens through the act of browsing, a serendipitous discovery, and I don't know, I don't have metrics on like how many sales come out of that, but if we talk about we talked about cover design to help sales at conventions, and we can talk about cover design to help sales on a shelf as well, right? Creating an eye-catching image that somebody when you're in, at the grocery store, when you are at um, a department store. There's a browsing aspect. There's a there's a ser I bet you can name a serendipitous discovery that you made when you were just looking through the office supply section at a store or mm -hmm. in the, the clothing section or the toy section, video game section, where you was like, I didn't even know that that existed or that I needed it until I found it, right? That is effectively mm -hmm. out of the picture when you're print on demand. Or it's very hard. It becomes very difficult to have that kind of browsing discoverability. Right. Yes, definitely. Now, sites like Indie Planet have solved this problem very nicely in terms of giving you a preview. Like, if you look at an Indie Planet listing, they're really lovely. And I, actually, I should pull pull them up real quick. Um, let me just go ahead and do that. So, um, in oh come on keyboard. Indie Planet. Yet, um, let's see, that that sort of. Uh, discovery is hard because I mean, it, discovery is is a is a function of how much traffic is going by, with the the and especially going by with the motivation to to discover things and that um, so if you're a part of a vibrant marketplace, it depends on where you're placed in that marketplace. And discoverability has to do with um, well, uh, how how searchable and findable, and then. When people do get there, you think of all these, all of these as steps and in, mm -hmm. in you at classic thing uh, that you'll run into when you're thinking of these kind of steps, it's this metaphor of the conversion funnel mm -hmm. where you know, on the wider side of it, that um, those are the people who become aware that you, that, that, that there's a thing that you exist. So like they're not even in your funnel yet until they somehow get near the listing of your, of your comic. Right. Mm -hmm. But then when they get there, now you have the uh, opportunity to get their attention and, and uh, you know, grow their interest to, to help them uh, decide to, to, to purchase. And there will be some percent. And when you analyze that way and say like, oh, um, <clears throat> depending on the platform, you may have a lot of access to these metrics or not. But yeah, here's how many people arrived. Here's how many people, you know, interacted with stuff. Here's how many people just left. Here's, you know, here's how many people have bought. And once you have those, those numbers, you can easily see this progression of, of, um, of, of interest to, to the point of conversion. I've got the Indie Planet site up. It's actually IndiePlanet.us, and you can see mm -hmm. what the listings look like. Here's a cover, and it's got some preview pages, and it's also got you might like also like these things, right? Mm -hmm. It's got uh, you know, a, a synopsis or like about the book kind of section. So it's doing a good job of making um <clears throat> browsing as as effective as it can be in that in that platform but yeah but my initial point was that it's like you can't just like walk by and go what's that right mm -hmm. so you lose that a little bit which again is it's not the end of the world right 
but it's just it's it's a con to think about. Yep, trade off. It's a trade off. Yeah. Um, okay, let's go back to the whiteboard, and let's talk about another one. Um, we mentioned a higher price point or higher unit cost, and oops, unit cost often equals higher price point, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, you, in order to to stay around, you pass that cost on to the onto the you know your audience. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, then then you are eating that, and then that's another con. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, either way, that yeah. cost is going someplace. It's being distributed mm -hmm. to somebody, whether it's you or your audience, right? Um, and then you know, not everybody's comfortable buying things online. I mean, I and I I don't mean this to be like, oh, some people are scared of their computer. It's just like, you know, some people don't like to buy from just a whole bunch of different sites. Maybe they've got an Amazon account, and they, then that's their place to buy stuff or maybe they just don't like to purchase things online directly from people they like that that interaction to happen between two people um you... my guess is you're i think you're probably just to care so in one, one way you're characterizing uh and we're getting we're kind of really close to the realm of just user experience design with a lot of this topic right so you, in a way you're just describing different personas of people in that could be in your audience maybe your audience has more of one than the other but one of those you're characterizing is is really interested in uh, and reminds me of like the uh, the ardent local supporter of like I support my local indie comics and I go to the uh, I go to the those events and I'm just you know I'm blind to all that all that other stuff um, yeah f but yeah versus um, the you know buying this this thing online that you know you didn't bring to the local event that I'm you know that's just not me. Versus right. someone who is totally there, where they're like, yeah, whatever. It's my credit card. The risk is low. I just want the stuff. Yep. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and I, I don't have... This, this would obviously, like, change depending on what your audience is largely comprised of. Um, so, but, and let's see. I don't know if we're going to... Um, I know we, we're going to think about, like, some actions to take, but, like, this one, I don't know if it's on our radar, is, like, you can... You can ask your audience, yeah, and and observe, like, what have you noticed? They're they're that they how do they behave so far when and when you're out at conventions or or listings on your um on your on your your uh, your store page, wherever that may be. Like like how do how are people behaving? Are they buying? Are they not? Right, and then, and then metrics, metrics. there's there's and gosh, it seems like this is something we've talked about in the show before. Is like you can provide a survey to them. Uh, and then you can track your metrics, track your sales, informal social conversation, ping your, tw ping, ping those who are following you on Twitter or wherever. Um, and then there's a bajillion great little survey tools out there. Google, Google, um, um, spreadsheets, forms, forms oh, right? Yeah. Which, uh, yeah, Google forms basically has like a, like a little web form on the front, but it's a spreadsheet on the back. So, and, and you can, you can put one of those out in the world for free. They're really easy yep. to make too. So that's uh, that's a way to, to to try to to help resolve some of these. Where if it's ambiguous, you're like, I don't know. I've got an active imagination. That's why I'm making comics. So now I'm super scared. This sucks. <laughs> so I'm, I'm uh, I you know so go ahead and get some data. Try to try to um, try to learn to see um, how your audience feels about this different stuff. Okay, and that so help. we modeled, we modeled the um, the the rubric of mm -hmm. pro and con list for what friction does it create for you and your audience, what problems does it solve for you and your audience. I'm wondering, having done this little walk through one particular concern this way, what narrative do we arrive at? Like, is there is there like a a, a stream of takeaways that you detected in all of this, Rob? I would I would say like the granularity of where this is useful is probably one decision. One decision at a time, or mm. or or one big influential influential part. So it's like maybe, um, should I go color? Should I go f uh, black and white interior color cover? Should I go fully black and white? You know, and and uh, should I go, um, you know, print on demand? Again, like let's say I've done it for a while and I've got some confidence I can move some moving up I can move some units here um of my book. 
all these things, right? So, so like you'll have the, the, the decision of then that, that last one would be print on demand versus um, offset printing. And each of these decisions, you can, um, you could play that out, I think. So um, color or black and white, what problem does it solve? What friction does it create? Um, and then when you're getting to your audience, you could, you could see, you know, how have they, how have they liked it? Um, if you've got like an inner circle, um, get their reactions, you know, I made a, I made a special black and white version. This would be super easy to do an awesome artist edition because, um, because it's affordable and, and it's, and it looks wonderful. I, this is part of how I envision my art to be, whatever. So it's going to depend on how you pull, how you, how you ask the question. Yeah. Cause if you're like, Oh, black and white, blech. what oh, do you guys yeah. think? Yeah, <laughs> I guess I could do ugly black and white. You guys, would you be okay with that? <laughs> yep. What yeah. do you guys think? You think I should do a turd book or a good book? It's more money for me. Yeah. You yeah. Like that, right. Right. Um, yeah. So I mean, it's going to be how you ask, and that's an important thing to practice too. So, um, but yeah, you, I mean, could, you could. Sorry, go ahead. Could you imagine using this rubric with like a question like page count? Like, how many pages should my book be? Um, I think so. It's sort of a, okay. So page count, that sounds, wow. That sounds really maybe that's an early, I, what, like what, what junctures in the project could you imagine exploring that question? Like in like, the inception, like before you even make the comic? Okay. Right. Like sitting down to thumbnail it and going like, well, how long do I really want this thing to be? Uh, hmm. because I'm inevitably going to print it. And do I want to print it in like a bunch of floppy volumes or do I want to do one trade volume? Uh, do I want to do it as a series of trade volumes at 40 pages each? Do I want, do I want these to be like hardcover volumes that are like, like how the French comics do it, where it's like these big, you know, 40 page volumes. That I do a whole bunch of those. Or do I want to do one big, you know, uh, 200 page book, like, hmm. like we do in the West now. Um, I could see doing it that juncture, but I can also see doing it midway through the process where it's like, oh, this thing's turning out to be a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. Um, do I break this story into chunks? Right? I'm at 200 mm -hmm. pages. I'm only at the halfway point. Right? Do I, do I print this up as the first chunk of the thing? Or do I wait until I've got another 200 pages behind me? Um, but that's all talking about problems for me. Like, can we ask, like, what problems does page count solve for an audience, right? And I guess you could, because you could ask yourself, mm -hmm. okay, <clears throat> who's my audience? How do they read my stuff? Um, are they reading it in big chunks? Are they reading it in small bits? Have I been serializing this on the web and slowly building an audience over time? Um, is, is my audience a bunch of 14-year-olds who don't necessarily have a lot of discretionary income and can't necessarily afford to, do, to pay for a $20 book? Mm-hmm. Right? Or are they, are my audience mostly adults who have that discretionary income that I can do the lavish printing? Right? Yeah, no doubt. Because for them, the, the cons would be it would cost more money. Right? But then it's also more collectible. It's also more um, instances of a thing that they're into and mm -hmm. um, in potential interactions with the creator. Um, that is a, uh, a pretty, it's, it's a, it, it can be a pro, can be a con for them, can be a pro, can be a con for you as well. Because, of course, a con for you is you're, you're, you are potentially waiting longer to profit from your work. Mm -hmm. what, and, I just, yeah. I, I like how we've arrived at this, this no, like really sort of driven home this idea that this really depends on a lot of variables. And this is why there is no right or wrong answer on this kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm because it really depends on the research you do with your particular conditions, what, what your resources are, what your intents are, what your desires are, and then also what, aud what audience you have and how they're interacting with the stuff that you make. All of these things should feed into the choice that you make. <clears throat> so there is no, this is the right page count, this is the wrong page count. Now, I would, I would argue that there are some probably best practices in certain respects in that look at what's happening in the traditional book publishing world because they have a lot of people who are measuring the way that people interact with their stuff, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. And they they are, um, if, if they may be connecting with an audience that's very representative of who you wish to connect with as well. Mm-hmm. And so their their choices and how they put their products into the world would have to do with all their trade-offs for connecting with that audience and what that audience is willing to support. And so some of those would probably relate to you as well and uh, be worth considering. So um, I guess a, a, like a, the, the idea that seeing um, like, hey, is an online marketplace, you know, okay with, does, is that, is that worth putting some time into getting a product out there? And you notice, well, well, large companies are doing it and they are supporting um, their industry with this or whatever. You, you know, do some research, see how much, like, um, see if you could get some insights, uh, if, especially if a company is publicly traded, um, like how much are they profiting from that thing or if they're willing to share, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, again, you find you can find some some input, some data. It's like, why did they make that choice? Yeah, might relate to you. Um, yeah. So that's I don't know. How do you feel about that that rubric? Um, I I feel like it's it's a it's a it's a good broad way to begin the investigation into what you want to do with your print thing. Mm-hmm. I, I I would argue that this would work for a variety of projects, not just print projects, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you want to provide a service to an audience, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> provide a product or service. And yeah, because uh, you could do this with like even web comics, where it's like mm-hmm. it's like the decisions that I made about Boulder and Fleet. Like, okay, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna post it natively in a variety of platforms, pro for audience. They don't have to go to any one place to get my stuff. Con for audience. There's no one canonical place to know to where to find it and interact with me, the author. Right, boom! You can start drilling down that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, it it's uh, yeah exactly. So it's essentially it's it's approaching your project with that sort of uh, service intent, and uh, probably also with the intent of of making it into um, a profitable um, endeavor. Well, Rob, I think we walked around it, <clears throat> as I always like to say at the end. Um, okay, well then, first I want to say, Rob, thank you for walking around this with me and helping me pick this thing apart. Um, and then I want to thank the listeners and viewers for uh, watching and downloading and listening. If you enjoy this stuff, a way that you can say thank you to us is to, you know, go to iTunes, give us a star review. You don't don't even have to write a review, just however many stars you think we deserve, though written reviews are super, super awesome. If you're watching the video on YouTube, giving it a thumbs up. Those things help more people find the show, which helps make more people funnel into the Patreon, which makes the thing more sustainable uh, for us. So that's a terrific free way to say thank you to us, right? Um, <clears throat> or if you want to support us, um, you know, in a, in a more, uh, well, I guess substantial way, you can go to leanintoart.com slash workshops, and that's where you can find more video material from us Um you know, and, and you know, chipping a few bucks into it helps make the show more sustainable, as well. Or go to our Patreon, which we mentioned halfway through the show. Right? Uh, you mm-hmm. can join us on Patreon, and we have the open mic posts where you can chat with us and share thoughts about things that are going on um, in your creative endeavors, and we will interact with you there. And uh, anything else that I missed there? There's a really good post going on this month about essentially your word that defines the year for you, which is a, which is a really fun, it's a fun exercise that, uh, yeah. So there's, and there's some good, good chat going on out there. Yeah. Everybody's uh, pitching is, in their words and their, ju- their justification for their words, which is really cool to see. Um, and there are some common themes that are emerging from everybody's, uh, words that they, that they share. But yeah, that's the kind of discussion that you can find there on our Patreon page. And it's patreon.com slash lean into art. Time for closing thoughts. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about, um, <clears throat> Tyler James. Yeah, we basically um, we're we're modeling a bit of the the kind of work that he has done for years at Comics Tribe, and he takes a very um, like a serious creative and business and craft angle, it hits the whole um, topic of making comics and then making a business out of comics from so many angles and does it super well, 
and uh, like Jersey's right now scrolling down this article, uh, think outside the floppy. Uh, that's one fantastic example as far as uh, like how he's exploring the topic print on demand. Uh, he also is exploring some of like the, the kind of trade-offs like we were discussing in, in, um, in, in with his approach in, in uh, a whole series of, of work surrounding like Kickstarter and, mm-hmm. and, and tons of other great, great work as well. Was there a particular uh, highlight that you wanted to mention? Well, I just uh, we'll link to this in the show notes, but I think a great place to start on this topic of mm-hmm. printing is that post. It's from it's from a couple years ago, but it's it's a great post where he talks he breaks down the numbers of what it costs to do a, a floppy magazine style comic through print on demand, and then trying to get it through traditional channels. And he talks about okay, well let's rethink what the magazine style print on demand comic even is. Is mm-hmm. this a unit of story that we sell as a product from now on, or is this a marketing tool or is this as you uh, said earlier rob uh a laboratory <clears throat> mm-hmm. and let's talk about labs <clears throat> oh this is really cool i have uh I've, I've only i've benefited by watching this process and 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 uh seeing seeing how it flows i haven't jumped in yet because of timing and whatnot but there's this sort of recurring uh email facilitated lab experiment at at Gumroad called the Small Product Lab, and it's in a way it's it's sort of this this sort of, um, it's a very experimental creative process where they're advocating for um, just get something in the world, just get it out there, essentially, and it's it it is you know being thoughtful about it and getting some feedback along the way, but it's not like you know overthinking it in the beginning. They're like. Uh, let your market show you how how they like your product, and in in worse and there's putting this fun challenge out at you know out at you to say well if you do this in ten days uh, you're gonna have a product you're gonna be selling it so in fact you're gonna be pre-selling it and I forget what day of the the workshop it is it's it's early on where you're getting pre-sales <laughs> and it's oh. sort of the or where there it's kind of like at, they get you to, to sell your product to at least one person, some really cool step where all of a sudden now it's like, you're on the line. You're going to get the, you know, this, you better get this out the door. And, and part of it is planning it so that it's not like a, you're totally doomed and, and, and it's for failure because you're like, well, this is the, this is now I'm getting that 200 page book done. Right. In, in 10 days. Nope. Um, this is more, like I bought, I've bought some of those small products, um, and I, I would name them right here, right, right now, if I could, off the top of my head. But like, there was one of them about how to make comics. There's one of them about uh, this this woman's approach to uh, writing her blog posts, right? And so it was a it's a thoughtful guide, a lesson that they're able to you know crank out in ten days. It's not like I think some people enter this as like I've developed a product for a little while, maybe not too long, but they, they come to it with a good amount of content. And then this is their final push to, you know, get it out in a sprint kind of thing. That's gumroad.com slash small product lab. So the idea, like, how is this applicable here? Right. So Jersey, what comes to mind when you, when you hear this, like, could you find this useful for doing a, a comic product experiment? Sure, I can think of doing like, okay, I'm going to do a, a, a 12 page mini comic where I test out the idea of this new character that I've been kicking around. Right? There you go. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Uh, you could, uh, yeah, I don't know, like tr- think of. Um, okay, um, I'm going to do a nine page mini comic where, uh, but it's going to be a web comic where if you hover over just the right place, it triggers a music event. Okay. There you go. Yeah, it's uh, testing some innovation in in your comic and it's it's uh see see the reaction to it. Or I'm going to test out and this is this is a real thing that I've actually been thinking about doing is I'm going to test out creating uh an, a small web comic story where I create it the way I create um comics on mini comic day where I don't allow myself to zoom in. I try to do each page in an hour or less, and I don't think of the story beforehand, but really try to improvise something and see if it's a shippable, desirable thing. Which, 
this is all perfect. So you have a thing you want to get out in the world, you think you want to test. And the other, like, I guess the, the, the details underneath that, that maybe deceptively simple challenge, right? Where it's like, Oh, I just have to work hard for 10 days. (laughs) Maybe it's kind of like that, but there's the, you're really ramping up and exploring that marketing and conversation for connecting to the audience Mm -hmm. in this lab. And so it's not just going to isolate and, and doing a creative challenge and who knows what comes out the other side. This is trying to get a product that people will buy out the door, which is a really cool, I would say different practice than a lot of us. Yeah. I think I need to do that this, this fall. I think it'd be really fun for the both of us to try to do something really small through this and chronicle our experience. That sounds like a good challenge. (laughs) That that crack you just heard Rob's voice, everybody. That was both of us saying like, we don't have the bandwidth for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, um, I do enjoy the growth process and the experiences I I have in these sorts of challenges. So, yeah, you sold me. it sounds really good. It sounds really good. And I mean, the hardest thing for me personally is answering the question of like, why is my audience's life better for me making this thing, other than it's nice to look at mm-hmm. or it's fun to read, right? What what real benefit does it serve? And I bet that's part of the marketing narrative I would discover, or it would help this 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 process would help me cultivate that message. <clears throat> and what's great is it is it is uh, it has that the it's high risk because it's a challenge, but it's low risk because it's encouraging to just um, the email. They, their writing is really good. Their process, I think, I feel like they did they've done a good job facilitating this. So. Um, mm. And you get to peek, you get to the peek in on it when you join their mail list. So we just did a big promo for their their mail list, but it they're awesome, and I'm I'm and I'm I'm happy and proud to do it. Uh, they um, let's see, yeah, I did, lots of love for the small product lab. Yeah, just joined and, it and that that kind of approach. All right. Well, do you want to mention Open IDEO real quick before we okay, close? Fair enough. Another yeah, super cool, like like uh, adding these couple. There's a couple of things that occurred occurred to me uh, late in the process, and uh, that's this is another another angle on this is to um, get experimental in the whole researching with your audience where you're maybe not doing a product right away. The other way you're you're doing more um, conversation. Uh, investigation and maybe prototyping and getting reactions to and whatnot but and that's sort of uh, the this sort this sort of uh, uh, human centric design thinking and innovation process at open IDEO which may sound why do comics open IDEO how do these fit together they're both very creative processes and you probably will be uh, benefit you will probably benefit by the insights you would gain by just sampling some of these approaches and uh, and this is more of just the general pointer of this is actually a pretty creative world to, that that they are um, demonstrating and and sharing lots of um, openly sharing their techniques as far as how they do this and your mileage may vary as far as if you're doing this you know solo or with a team but like you'll probably find especially the whole like um, ways to ask questions of your audience. And almost like the next time you table, I would say that that could be an opportunity to be a little more of a researcher mm. by, you know, exploring a, a, their approaches for, for learning from people. Like if someone comes to your table, for instance, and then you, you, you get into um, a little bit of, you're probably going to uh, dent your sales by doing this, but inherently if you are, you know, thinking about this, you may be trying to learn more to find out how you can increase, increase your sales. So you may say like, so tell me about like the last time you read, you read a comic and was it, uh, or, or the last time you read a comic that was kind of in the, my comic genre, like this is like action and adventure. Like mm. how'd that go? Like, I don't know. What'd you react to? <laughs> and, uh, I love hearing people talk about their comics, you know, things and you're, you're, you know, listening and take notes and, yeah. you know, f- try to try to pull out like what are the highs and lows of that. So anyway, th- that kind of like um, human centric interviewing type stuff and lots of designy thinking type things are going to be out here. And it's a fun site. So, so I'm going to make a Kickstarter to fund Rob to come to A2CAF this summer 
and have a live web stream of his table so we can just watch over his shoulder like a little bird and listen to these <laughs> listen to that research <laughs> happening and watch the notes happen because you guys if you haven't sat across the table from Rob and had a conversation and watched his pen fly it's pretty amazing <laughs> uh, everyone's mileage may vary because <laughs> it, it depends some sometimes when the table starts to look like a I don't know, a breakout screen because there's all these bricks in front of me with these little note cards. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, you know, there's, there are some personas who are like, well, that's fascinating. So other people are like, <laughs> <laughs> you writing something about me? <laughs> that's true. What's on, what's on that card, smart guy? What'd you, what'd you do in there? That's true. Well, I, I, for, this I table. for one really dig it. But Cool, man. Thank right. you. All right. So thanks for adding that stuff, Jersey. That that was fun, and thank you for all. Like this, this is a real, was a really fun exploration of what started out as just like, hey, what if we, you know, did the did the user and and uh, creator side of things? Yeah. What if what if we took Jersey a topic developed. that we really feel is like not entirely in the lean into art wheelhouse, but find a way to go at it as as we do. And so that was a <laughs> cool design challenge. So uh, I mean, actually, I should thank uh, it was Angela, right? Who who first? Put, yeah, Angela Mitchell. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Angela, for suggesting this. And uh, we'd love to hear from anybody else who has topic suggestions for the show. In the meantime, thanks, everybody, for downloading, watching, and listening. I have been Jersey Drozd of LeanIntoArt.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of LeanIntoArt.com and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at LeanIntoArt.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user lean into art and you can reach us via email at lean into art at gmail.com and remember leaners aren't wieners thanks for listening Facts. <laughs> and there we go thanks everybody i'm gonna kill the stream thanks for watching yeah thank you very much